I think we'll be looking at some of the uh, solutions. And first, we're going to look at where some of the problems persist. And the first area is going to be housing. Uh, we have a great panel. It's going to be led by our moderator, who is a news anchor and journalist for MSNBC and NBC News, where he hosts the Western edition of Early Today. And uh, he used to work at CNN for five years. He was the uh, first Asian American male to anchor a daily cable news show, and today, unfortunately, is the only Asian American to anchor a daily news network newscast. For 25 years, he's been uh, active in community leadership, including with the UN Foundation, the State Department, Harvard University, and many other uh, important NGOs. He's been honored by many of them, including the NAACP. He's written in many for many magazines and newspapers. Uh, but I think one of the more interesting things is for 15 years he worked in business where he still holds a patent for a uh, bank-centric payment system that he did from a, a Citibank uh, spin-out or carve-out. Uh, so he's a businessman, he's a journalist. Please welcome Richard Louis. Right here, Charlie. Oh. Yeah, good to see you. Where is he? He's right on my nose. That's where he's at. Well, thank you so much, Charlie. In fact, I'm going to sit on down right over here, and Mark will put you over here on the fly here. Good morning, all of you. And uh, what a pleasure it is to be here on this day. And Juan, it's always great to see you. And really enjoy the opening remarks, Charlie. As always, I really enjoy this, and Kiana, it's good to see you again. So as we now dived into housing specifically in the state of race, I'd like to welcome up our panelists today. Uh, please, if you could, welcome this uh, morning with me, Tanner Colby, author of Some of My Best Friends Are Black. We've also got Lisa Hasegawa, the Executive Director, National Coalition for Asian Pacific American Community Development. Come on up, guys. Don't be shy. We also have Mark Hugo Lopez, the Director of Hispanic Research at Pew Research Center. Good morning to all of you guys, as I think they're going to get their mics all set for us uh, this morning. Uh, and the purpose, as you can see in the outline today as we dive into housing, is to answer some very key questions about housing. As we saw that downturn in 2007, the Great Recession, how it affected specific uh, minority groups, and how they have rebounded since. And what are some of the underlying dynamics? And we've got a, a bunch of data. Tanner, good. you're the first one up here. How about we uh, start with you as I get in the mic so we yeah. can stay productive? Shoot, I'll just hold this down until they get here. All right, you just talk, talk I'll for just keep, I'll just keep long talking. periods of time and use a lot, lots of numbers. That's exactly. awesome. very, very okay. well. It fools all of us once you bring up the numbers, right? Right, right. So when we think of the state of race in housing, what is the state? Uh, not great. Um, you Thank know, you very much. Next. Uh, <laughs> You know, there was uh, there's these great, uh, you know, with all the big data, there's these great maps that have been going around the Internet, color-coded, showing all of the uh, uh, just severe racial divides in all of our cities across America. And there was this uh, report that came out of the uh, Conservative Manhattan Institute last year reporting that racial segregation in housing was getting far, far better. And I was like, well, that's interesting. And so I went and I, I read the study, and I was, like, reading halfway through in, like, in the methodology section, which is a really boring section that, no, you know the, but you read it. Yeah, I yeah. read it. Um, and it said, for the purposes of this uh, study, a census tract will be defined as a neighborhood. And I thought, well, you might as well say that for the purposes of this study, a bagel will be defined as a donut. Because a census tract is not a neighborhood. Um, a census tract is a you know, square root of area. And, and you know, a neighborhood is an ecosystem of people and institutions and cultural norms and all these other things. And if so if you look at... I mean, yeah, obviously the data has gotten better since there was, you know, a severe color line that you get bombed sure, if you crossed right, it. Right. Um, while the data might be getting better, uh, there was nothing in the study that looked at the integration of institutions and people and, uh, and, and those sorts of things. And, you know, I always say, having looked at uh, housing and from my book, that you can't look at a neighborhood or a company or a school or anything else and call it an integrated neighborhood or an integrated company because institutions don't integrate, people do. So the proper question is who in the neighborhood has integrated and with whom have they integrated? Mark, to you on this, uh, the headline that we read very often and that we see very often is that the recession and the downturn in housing hurt minorities the most. 
Yes, and you can see it in particularly home ownership rates. We reached a peak of home ownership rates for African Americans and for Latinos in 2006, right before the beginning of the recession. But through 2007, things began to stall, and since then, we've seen a decline in the home ownership rate for both of these groups. This is particularly true for immigrant Latinos, um, but nonetheless, you see this decline in the home ownership rate. For Hispanics, for example, fewer than half right. today own their homes, but in 2006, it was, nearly, it was nearly half. So those are the numbers. Why? What's the underlying? What's the methodology or the footnotes that uh, we were talking about a second ago? Well, I think a lot of it is linked to what happened with jobs in the economy. So as the recession was starting in 2006, particularly as the housing bust, uh, boom became a bust, many Latinos in construction lost their jobs. That had an impact on home ownership rates among Latinos, and Latinos still haven't quite recovered from that. So uh, when I was asking the state of race as I was stalling there for a second, and when Tanner and I were talking... Uh, what is the state of race? He was pretty clear about it. I think that the uh, state of race when, it, when we talk about housing, sorry. When you're talking about housing, I think it, certainly there are differences and there's a divide when it comes to home ownership and the creation of wealth. Whether you're talking about Latinos and African Americans or whites or Asians, there are divides across all these different groups on different measures. But certainly some of these gaps have become larger since the onset of the recession. I'm simple. Good, bad. I Horrible, say, great. I would say that uh, some progress, but a lot yet to be made. Lisa? Not great. Okay. <laughs> I like that. Good sound bites, right? We like that. Um, do you want me to talk a little bit more well, about why Asian not? We got some time. We got time. Um, okay. So, uh, you know, Mark and I have been colleagues for a while, and we're often on stage together talking about Latinos, Af African Americans, Asian Americans. Um, and often what comes up is uh, the model minority myth and um, sort of where Asian Americans fit in in terms of a broader racial equity sort of frame. Um, so that's what I wanted to talk a little bit about. In terms of homeownership, um, Asian Americans have consistently lagged behind whites. Uh, but I think on a lot of other indicators, um, a lot of reports come out from Open Institute, from Pew, from Nielsen, et cetera, saying that Asian Americans are doing really well, even today. Um, so in contrast, Asian Americans... Um, our study, oh, okay, um, we came out with a report of looking at Asian Americans, Pacific Islanders, and poverty, and um, one of the things that we found was that um, because of the housing crisis, uh, we think that uh, it was a big cause for the um, uh, loss of $70,000 of net worth um, between 2005 and 2011. So we lost, as Asian Americans, 44% of our house household wealth. Uh, and we think that it was much due to the housing crisis uh, and the housing bust um, because uh, Asian Americans tend to live uh, where there are higher housing costs. Um, so I can go into it a little bit more. But certainly I think that you know some of the research, if you dig a little deeper, Asian Americans um, uh, are not the middle minority. I'm not seeing that in the numbers, though, Lisa. Uh, are, are you telling me that the numbers are too broad then when you're, you're talking about that particular segment? Trick question. Uh, Richard wants me to talk about disaggregated data um, and the fact that um, when you look at Asian American uh, data in the aggregate, it often uh, covers up a lot of what's going on with subpopulation groups, Pacific Islanders, Southeast Asians, etc. However, um, the Asian American poverty report that I was referencing, um, we actually found that even for Asian Americans in the aggregate, um, Asian American poverty grew by 40% in the wake of the Session. There's over 2 million Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders living in poverty today, uh, and it was one of the largest increases in the wake of the recession. So um, even in the aggregate, and Asian American, American-born Asians um, uh, are more likely to be in poverty than those who are more recent immigrants. Um, and so I think that our immigration policies right now are also benefiting those or favoring those that are wealthy. The wealth gap, Tanner, uh, as we've talked about over the last 10 years, certainly not looking good. No. And as we, as we look at housing, and, how, and I was reading a headline this morning, uh, I believe, on Bloomberg, and how it's, when we look at housing and the issue with housing and how it's contributing to the wealth gap, mm -hmm. that it's, it's only getting worse because the access for these groups that we've just talked about is not increasing uh, despite this little bit of a bubble that we're in right now. Yeah, no, I mean, if, if there was a silent auction, white people got in early and got to bid on all the good property on all the high ground about, you know, 75 years before everyone else. And what's, what's, what makes this persistent is what, 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 an interesting fact is that in 1900 there was no such thing as a majority black neighborhood in America. Most of the blacks were still in the South, were still in rural communities. If you, if you went to any city, like Kansas City was the city I wrote about in my book, right. no black person in Kansas City at the turn of the 19th century lived in a neighborhood that was more than 14% black. 
And so this idea of the ra racialization of space, this is a white neighborhood, this is a black neighborhood, was an idea that had to be invented. Because as blacks started moving north from the south, Jim Crow didn't come as a legal framework, right. but uh, real estate developers realized that they could turn Jim Crow into a product. They could monetize it and turn it into land that you could buy. Uh, which is why housing segregation proved far more persistent than legal segregation in the South, because I bought this segregation. I own it, and it's worth something. Um, and so white people hold on to that, and to them it has a value. And to all of us, we perceive it as having a value. We, we perceive minority neighborhoods' uh, housing as being less and, and, and white neighborhoods as being worth more, and that ultimately in the marketplace, that perception Ted, I, I couldn't help but think of one example when you brought up that point. I was just down in Memphis, Tennessee at the Lorraine Hotel where MLK was shot 46 years ago Friday. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't help but think what LBJ had said to him. Said, we need an illustration. We need an illustration to tell people how difficult it is to, in this case, the Voting Rights Act. Mm -hmm. In this case of housing, what's the illustration that we need to tell America that this is a problem? I honestly don't know. I mean, and that's, you bring up MLK, that's the great point. On, on civil rights and on the, you know, the Selma voting march, providing the great, you know, moral suasion and the great spectacle changed the nation's mind. When King tried to do the exact same thing in the bungalow belt of Chicago, he just had a, a rain of bottles and bricks on his head, and he went home and said, I, uh, no, this isn't going to work. Um, so I don't know, other than the foreclosure crisis and seeing huge swaths of suburban Las Vegas closed up and shrinked in plastic wrap and, and foreclosed homes, you know, I don't know how much more of a spectacle we need, but it still hasn't sunk in. Mark, what's the illustration? I think it's, uh, uh, it's, it's partly about the foreclosure crisis and how that particularly impacted Latino communities, minority communities out west. Uh, I'm thinking particularly California, Vegas, Arizona, etc. But I also think it's an image about retirement and thinking about the future. Because what I think is also happening is for Latinos, many of them are young people who are entering the job market for the first time, who are going to be trying to buy a home soon. Our polling shows that Hispanics uh, overwhelmingly believe that the ownership of a home is an important goal to have. That it's actually good to be a homeowner, yet many of them are not homeowners. And if you look at their, their wealth and so forth, even for those who are in the middle of their, of their lives, in the middle of their careers, many are in debt. Many are not homeowners. Oftentimes the asset that they tend to have that's sort of the most valuable might be a vehicle, for example, as opposed to an investment. So I think that thinking to the future, not only is it a what role will Latinos and other uh, minority groups play in supporting retirees in the future, but it's also what will be their retirement 20, 30, 40 years from now. Lisa, I'm going to grab this clicker over here as you... Yeah, uh, well, a couple of things, uh, just in terms of segregation and Asian Americans, I just want to make a couple points. Um, the Chinatowns and the little Tokyos that are um, revered today and so well-loved because of the great food, um, they were created because of segregation, because of um, the alien land laws, you know, not allowing people to, of Asian or Chinese descent to be able to own property. So I just wanted to say that I think that we have a shared history in terms of a lot of well, the racial well, segregation. Well, let me read a number here. This is uh, coming from HUD. 2002 to 2005, what they found in terms of the frequency of racial steering across the nation, across the country here, they found that that illegal practice happened in 87% of the time than that they had minority testers. That they were directed into these more desi uh, less desirable neighborhoods or more depending on who's saying it. 87%. Yep, I think that um, there's... Uh, and this is during the good times. This is during the good times, right. Uh, and so I think that um, we spent a lot of political capital uh, talking about and passing um, health care reform, and now we need to talk, talk, start talking about housing reform. It's not in the political discourse as much as it should be, uh, but I think that all of the related things, not only the setbacks that it had for communities of color, uh, but also there are so many barriers, particularly for immigrant communities um, with regards to accessing credit, uh, members of Congress, policymakers are rewriting the rules right now, yeah. uh, setting the groundwork yeah. for the next 50 years of what housing access to home ownership is going to look like. And we're not talking about it publicly as much as we should. And by the way, guys, butt in anytime you want because I like that stuff. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think <laughs> to me, uh, you know, other than the sort of the, the access to credit and that sort of thing and the, the sort of the overarching symbolic idea of this is black space, that's white space, which we've all internalized, by the way. Spike Lee, you know, went viral with his gentrification. This is ours. Well, if that's yours, then, you know, this is theirs, and everything becomes balkanized. And there's really two, to me, you can't 
uh, you know, disentangle the issue of schools and housing because those, you know, often all, you know, always come down together. And there's two decisions that really sort of undid everything we were trying to do with, with school integrations and the civil rights movement. One was Milliken v. Bradley in, the, in Detroit, which is, you know, all the whites had flown to the suburbs, and in order to create a, in a meaningful desegregation plan, you had to, you know, bus blacks all over the suburbs and try and bus white students back downtown. Well, they came up with this massive Normandy invasion of a busing plan that was going to inc- include 53 independent school districts and bring out all the white kids back down, take all the black kids out of the suburbs. Well, this was invalidated by the Supreme Court, on purely specious racial grounds by saying that no, uh, a, a suburban school district is its own independent constitutional actor. Never mind that the state of Michigan was the constitutional actor right. that, that should have been right. providing equal protection uh, and access to education. Like, no, no, no. The, each little individual suburb can be its own little fiefdom. Um, and that was followed by the Rodriguez case in San Antonio, which basically said that no, a wealthy neighborhood can pass its own property tax and raise its own uh, local services and education, and they don't have to share the money with the neighboring poor district, which is kind of the Citizens right. United of, of education funding. Right. So those two decisions working together, basically, <coughs> we invalidated separate but equal for, for individual schools, but those two decisions you know, sort of re-sanctioned separate but equal for whole towns. And that's what really balkanized our metropolitan landscape, you know, and many other factors as well. In, as long as those two things are in place, you know, and, and access to schools, you know, is such a, a critical factor in how people choose and where to live. I, I don't know. I mean, it, it, that's the foundational thing that you have to choose. You to write about housing and community development. That's one of your themes here. Uh, when I was living in Atlanta around the HBCU area, very rich space, mm-hmm. but there's no home ownership. There's no community. Uh, they go home, uh, they sleep, and then they leave to go to work. But when you look for community services in the area to, to help those kids that are in that area, they're not there. If it weren't for the HBCUs that are there that, that are trying to improve the environment, right. it, which is a, classically a rich, rich area in terms of community, it's now gone. So this is a, a very clear example of what you're trying to say. And then how do we turn that around? Anyone else? I don't know. Um, I gave you the easy question. Come yeah, on. Yeah, yeah. No, it was you know I in Kansas City I met with the priest uh, Father Norman Roder who was at a, a white church. It was formerly a white community and then flipped all black uh, during his tenure there. And he had tried to you know create an integrated community, to create fellowship, and get people together. But the the, the real estate forces were just too powerful, and he couldn't. Yeah didn't understand what was happening and then shifted. So he, he went back and he got a real estate broker's license. Yeah. And he started working with HUD, and he's you know sort of a, a real estate broker with a priest caller. Um, and he's been fighting for four that years. That sounds like a great interview, by the I way. I know, yeah. I know. If more real estate brokers had priest callers, we might uh, <laughs> be on our way. Well, I don't um, know. Yeah. And, and I asked him, I was like, what, what makes a neighborhood? His one-word answer was relationships. Mm. And if you don't have relationships forming some sort of social cohesion, then you don't have a neighborhood, which is why a lot of sort of, you know, disquieting studies have come out saying that, no, racially homogenous neighborhoods are actually kind of a little bit better because they do have social cohesion around churches and cultural institutions. And if you just take people of different ethnicities and put them in the same zip code, yeah, you have diversity. Right. But you don't have any kind of integration. You don't have any kind of shared community. I don't want to go too far afield here, Mark, but it, since she was talking about Detroit, what I saw in Detroit was, we, and it's a chicken-egg question, isn't it? Uh, there was a small community in East Detroit, if I've got that right, uh, in the eastern parts of Detroit, where they created a little, a little school and it's because you had people of all different backgrounds that decided to move back as it was affordable, and they wanted to do something together. And they started this charter school with 30 kids, and they're handling, you know, six grades. Uh, th- which comes first, since we're talking about education, those elementary schools, or is it, is it the families moving back, and how they work together? It's a very good question, and it's hard. I think you're right that it's the chicken or the egg. It's hard to say. I think on the one hand, people coming together may create institutions to reflect their preferences and what they want, and that might that's part of the social cohesion, part of what makes these places work. But on the other hand, people may be moving there because there is the start of some institutions there, and then that enhances the institutions. One of the questions I wanted to ask that I thought maybe it would be interesting to hear the panelists talk about would be on the other side of this, because we've talked a lot about discrimination and segregation in housing, but there's also some evidence that people choose to self-segregate. They choose to live in neighborhoods because of what you just described, because of the institutions, et cetera, or because of the presence of churches, or because of the presence of other mm. Latinos in this neighborhood. Got it. Latinos are a 
among the most segregated, particularly when it comes to schools mm -hmm. and particularly when it comes to their neighborhoods. But when you see, for example, a Latino community um, that's relatively new, say in a place like Minnesota, um, Latino immigrants are moving to a place with other Latino immigrants, and eventually that leads to the development of immigrant services, et cetera, in that place. Some parts of the country are more advanced on this than others, but you see sort of this interesting diversity around the country on the institutions. But Latinos looking for Latinos. What's the number behind that, since you're a numbers guy, that, that about self-choosing to be in these these areas? Ah, it's a good question. Uh, uh, when you take a look at Latino students in schools, sort of as this measure, yeah, yeah. you'll find that about 80 plus percent of Latino students attend schools that are majority Latino. So they're in schools that are largely with other Hispanic students, and that's a reflection of where these families are partly choosing to live, but there's more to it than just where they're choosing. There's also some segregation, et cetera, and some historical circumstances as well. So you're talking about places like the Mission District in San Francisco, for instance which has a very vibrant Latino, Hispanic American community. But changing, but changing. But changing, yes. but changing yeah. which is where I'm flipping this to. So on the, on the flip side, then we have the pushing out of the, this great diversity, these great communities that you're describing, whether you opt in or not. Lisa. Uh, complex. complex. Um, well, it's been 50 years since the um, in investments in institutions called community development corporations. It was part of the response to the war on poverty. It was part of the war on poverty. Um, and uh, I think that we have uh, sort of neglected that uh, set of institutions. Community development corporations essentially are nonprofit uh, real estate brokers. And um, uh, they may not wear collars. Well, some of them do, actually, because there are many church-based CDCs. But there's an infrastructure that used to really focus in on the building of neighborhoods, the building of community, uh, and um, diverse uh, neighborhood relationships and, and, those, and those social networks. And I think that there are many that are still out there. You know, we have many in our network, the National Coalition for Asian Pacific American Community Development. We are founded by CDCs, short name, yes, yeah. national capacity. Mm -hmm. But many of our institutions, like the East Bay Asian Local Development Corporation in Oakland, they serve 40% African American, 40% Asian, uh, and 20% um, uh, Latino, uh, roughly. And so I think that those are really interesting statistics. So you have Asian-led uh, institutions that are serving um, a very multiracial uh, population reflecting those neighborhoods in which they, they uh, exist. Um, so I think that there are uh, a lot of actually bright bright spots. Um, I think, Mark, you bring up um, an interesting issue that we deal with all the time um, with regards to uh, these ethnic enclaves, right? And, um, and whether it's a, it's a positive thing or a negative thing. And I, it's, it's hard to say whether it's, it's negative or positive completely, right? Because um, where you might have the Mission District, there's also um, Monterey Park, Right, and uh, uh, and there are other enclaves uh, where there are a lot of uh, Asian uh, Americans, and so we actually did a lot of that mapping. I'm not a numbers person as much. Um, we got balance here. That's but okay. We, we got balance um, <laughs> but we um, but we did map some of that out, and um, we looked at whether low income Asian Americans were more likely to live with wealthy Asian Americans or more likely to live with uh, poor people, other poor people of color. And um, it was a mix. It was a mix, depending on the state. Yeah. Go ahead. I mean, the, the, the whole cultural affinity point, it's absolutely true. And it's neither good nor bad. It is. You know, when I'm, I lived in my neighborhood because my college roommate's girlfriend had also moved there and we were going to live near her. You talk to most of the black people who live in, not most, but the black people that I spoke to who live in Prince George's County, when I asked them, why'd you move there? They said, well, we wanted to be near my wife's family because they helped with the babysitting. You know, it's, it's things like that. But then you also have this, you know, legacy of segregation un undergirding it, um, and so cultural affinity and tribalism is 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 probably you know in many ways a net good. The problem, of course, being is that white people have all the money, and not only do white people have all the money, you know, sort of hold up in their communities, but you know the the social norms and and, and social capital that you need to enter a lot of you know. Uh, economic spaces to have opportunity is also housed there. So it's not so much, you know, it, it's more about do people have access mm -hmm. to get from one to the other? Is there affordable housing? Is there public transportation? Are there jobs nearby? So that then people have the freedom to make choices and to decide who they want. Do I, do I prefer an ethnic enclave, even though that might not give me access to certain other economic uh, opportunities, but it provides what I want, which is a community? Or do I want to go 
and be the only Asian or black family on the block and decide to be there and deal with that because I believe that's what I want for my children. Mm -hmm. So since you talked about uh, white Americans having all the money, I wanted to at least allude to the numbers I have up beside me, and that is the homeownership rates across the country, and this is from Zillow. Uh, And it it appears here, Mark, um, that 74% of white Americans also have the homes in terms of the ownership rates in their own community, the highest number of any of the other three groups, and we could go on. There's obviously more uh, subgroups that we could look at. When you look at these numbers, what do you see in the Rorschach test here? I see uh, a number of different things. First, I think the education levels and the age, the median age of different communities is affecting those numbers. Hmm. So, for example, the white community is, is, is an older or higher median age, also oftentimes uh, better educated than many of these other communities. That has led to uh, the ability to buy a home and the time. Yeah, let's also buy. not forget the government gave us our houses after World War II. They just gave them to us for free, whereas, you know, they didn't for everyone else. So, yeah. 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 And, and then I would say that in the case of, uh, in the case of Latinos here, uh, I think this is really a reflection of um, – the relative youth and the types of jobs that Hispanics have, that it's, it's difficult to afford a home. Um, they, uh, many Latinos, as I had said earlier, uh, express a preference for wanting to own their home, but I think this is a reflection of some of the challenges that many face when it comes to being able to afford it. And that's within the groups. I mean, I wanna, I'll move forward to this next slide. I hit the button right here. And, and this is where it kind of breaks down just in the overall market. I know the numbers are really, really small here, but the number... That I, I like to look at, or all of them that I like to look at here, is you look at the share of population on the top side, and you can see whites 63%, uh, blacks 12%, Asian Americans 4.6, Latino Hispanics 17.3. But then you look at the disparity from the top to the bottom, and that bottom row is those who've gotten the successful mortgage application in. And, and then you see a drop with Latinos, for instance, of 12%, 12 percentage points. Uh, when you look at African Americans, you're looking at a drop of 10 percentage points. Uh, and with Asian Americans, it pops the other way positive, as well as it does for white Americans. Lisa? What's going on there? I will have to crunch those numbers some more because I'm very skeptical when I see uh, a lot of the um, numbers on Asian Americans um, in the aggregate. Um, but I do think I do think that um, you know Asian Americans' uh, net worth is is still higher, and it is still higher than African Americans and Latinos. And I think that that um, is oftentimes you know, what you will see in terms of home ownership. Um, what I would say, though, also is that a lot of Asian Americans pool household income, so it's two or three families mm-hmm. that are purchasing a single home. So I think that that also kind Four of... Four people, speaks. let's just say, versus two people in other applications. That's correct. So um, I think that there was this number that um, some of the... Uh, Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae, they kept throwing me this number that all these Asian Americans were taking all these jumbo loans. And I said, well, yeah, that's because there's four families that are pulling their, you know, income to get this one home. Um, But, you know, it's never presented that way. Um, So I would would have to uh, dig in a little bit bit more to um, have a a different... To the rest of the panel, I mean, I I see those disparities, uh, those percentage points uh, disparities. Uh, How did it get there? These are successful mortgage applications again. Mm -hmm. Um, can, can I ask you to? I can't see it from here. Sure. And I didn't quite. I didn't quite catch. So the first row is population, right? So it's that's population correct. distribution. That's correct. What is the second row? So the second row in this is the uh, number of conventional mortgage applications. So those are applications that go out. Uh-huh. But I wanted to quickly yeah. go just to the bottom, which yes. is what is successful. Right. right. I think. Th- I think that middle row is interesting because I think it's also perhaps a reflection of. Uh, you can see Latinos are le- are, are a smaller share of the applicant pool. So they're just and, not applying is what you're saying. They're just not right. applying. Right. But I think that the 17% is a little bit of a, of a, of a I don't want to say a problem, but the 17% reflects the entire U.S. population. I think it would be better to have this as, as the households in the United States. Why aren't they applying? I was going to say because many of those, that, seven, that drop from 17 yeah. to 5 is because there's so many young Latinos, they're just not you. applying because they're under 18. They haven't, they don't have, they're still in school. So I think that okay. you need to adjust these numbers to be households rather than population. Oh, you had None, to do that to my numbers, didn't nonetheless, you? Nonetheless, 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 <laughs> answer your question because I think it's a good question. I think that, uh, uh, that part of the reason why Latinos are not applying is because either um, they're unsure they're going to be able to actually get a mortgage. And just to give you a, a personal experience, 
uh, when I was a professor at Maryland, uh, I remember standing in line, and this one Latina who was an immigrant from El Salvador, she kept asking me every time I would come to the line, can you look at my housing application? Can you tell me how I can buy a house? I want to buy a house. And then eventually she tried, and she kept getting told no, 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 no. She stopped trying to apply. So I'm not sure if that's partly also reflecting this difficulties that some people may be having. Why was she getting the no, 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 no? I think it was they didn't have enough. Uh, they didn't have enough money, and her and her husband were trying to buy a house, perhaps bigger than, and more expensive than they really could afford. They were really stretching themselves. Well, when you've got six out of ten who are born abroad who are of voting age, is, is there also a cultural language issue where ESL certainly? At, these are not simple applications. Yeah, this, this it, is pretty daunting when you sit across the table sometimes. And the, and she had a lot of questions just about the process, about how it works, because she was foreign born and unsure of how this works. And she was asking for me to help her with on on. You know, translating much of the application into Spanish yeah, because right. she was unsure about what exactly. to do. That is part of it. I would say that uh, among adult Hispanics, half are foreign born. Among all Latinos, only 38% are foreign born. Tanner, what about the African American data line very quickly here? Why are we seeing a 10 percentage point drop um, in both cases, applications and again approvals? You know, well, just discrimination. I mean, it's been, it's been shown time and time again that, you know, uh, Whites of lower income will be get a mortgage that blacks of higher income will will be denied, um, and that's been you know uh, the case for for decades now. Uh, redlining you know was outlawed in 1948 when the Supreme Court uh, you know made it illegal, but they actually didn't you know go around the country striking it down. They just said, well, it's not enforceable in a court of law. Well, nobody would you know take that to court because it, you know they didn't have the, the means to do so. So. <laughs> It wasn't really successfully challenged. All these residential color lines in the suburbs weren't really successfully challenged until the 60s and early 70s. And even then, until the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act, which forced banks to you know, reveal their data, you, know, you could continue redlining. You know, and, and it continues to this day. I mean, I, I wouldn't have my apartment if I weren't a white person. I mean, I live in my neighborhood. And Why I do you say that? I knew somebody who knew the broker, and I saw it before it went on the market, which is so illegal. It's so illegal. <laughs> But you know this is being streamed, by the way. No, that's fine. I, I'm that's, just saying. That's fine. I, those guys over there, they're not standing there for it's, fun. It's, it's the New York City real estate market. It's doggy dog. You do what you have to do. And, and I went, you know, I spent months, the, you know, going through all the listings. It was just overpriced garbage with smokers and cats. And it's like, ah. Oh. And, then, and then a friend of mine is like, oh, well, you, th this broker has the listings. And so, and, you know, he, he knows people who knows people. And he, you know, it's all these, you know, old families that want to rent to good people and, and good prospects. And my wife and I went, and, you know, I clean up okay. And, and, and that's a, that's your opinion. Yeah. Well, <laughs> um, and my wife's far more pedigree than I am. And it's like, eh, done. No credit check. We brought all of our tax information and credit check. Yeah, just signed. All right. That, and, and we're going to get to questions and answers uh, in about 30 seconds. And that, that alludes to my last slide, or one of the slides I've got here. That's a denial rate. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and you can see here... It, it really does fit the argument that you're making, whether all of those do reflect that in terms of the denial rates for applications to mortgages. Right. Um, all right, so we've got, what, does it count at 10 or 15 minutes for question and answers? And there's a question over here? No, no, one, one microphone. Well, we've got one microphone, but you, you can scream loudly if you're over on this side. A a any questions? How are you? Yeah, sure, why not? Because uh, I think we're, for our, the folks that are watching via the stream, including uh, law enforcement officials that are going to take Tanner out of here shortly. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't break the law. Just kidding. Just kidding. Yeah, I would like for you to speak a little bit about the uh, What's your name, by the way? My name is Deborah Lathan. And you're with? I'm with my own telecom consulting right. firm. Okay. okay. So I would like for you to speak a little bit about the significance of housing and the accumulation for wealth for future generations. Right. What that means if you are cut out of the housing market, what does that mean for the future generations of African Americans and Asians? Because I know a significant amount of most Americans' wealth is in their home. Right. So how do you pass on wealth if you don't have your home to pass on to the next generation? Right. We, we touched on a little bit earlier, but it, it, it seems like it would only get worse then. Yep. That's why I was saying we were taking steps back. And again, they are also rewriting a lot of the rules for housing um, and access to mortgages, um, they have, uh, they're writing, they've written rules about what's a, a qualified mortgage. And it's going to leave a lot of people of color out and a lot of lower income folks out. And so um, I think that it's of great concern. I 
um, am not too hopeful. Uh, and I think that we will be sitting here in another couple of decades looking at, um, you know, some of the housing reform uh, regs that were passed um, in 2013, 14, 15. Uh, and it's, uh, we'll be looking at the negative impacts. I think that um, there's still an opportunity to influence it, but it's, it's, um, it's not good. I mean, we, we're talking about, um, uh, talking about ending the racial wealth gap. And then we're like, well, well is it really, it's, it's, is it the gap? And you know, so many people lost so much wealth uh, that it didn't um, you know, seem like much of a, 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 an achievement to um, reduce the racial wealth gap when everyone had lost so much. But still, there's that disparity, right? And so um, there's disparate impact laws that are being debated right now. Uh, there's a lot of more like uh, uh, tools that, are, that measure systemic discrimination and patterns that a lot of time individuals will not see or will not notice, and therefore they won't report it, right? And so I think that there's just a lot more um, that we need to do as um, uh, to get the word out about a lot of these uh, old civil rights tools to the younger generation who right. sometimes don't know, um, you know, that they, they exist. Right. I think also one of the one of the things that I've learned from my life because we're poor white trash from Louisiana. My great grandfather's actually a sharecropper, you know, which just shows you how far you can go if you're white. Um, and it, it's it's you know we we look Again, at that's your opinion, right? Uh, yeah. My opinion. <laughs> Um, you know, we look at things like, you know, the prejudice against the black community, and, and, and so we, we think, you know, that, okay, we're going to pass laws that are going to equalize this, and then, you know, different groups will get different access. Um, but to me, in the way I sort of look at society and what I've seen, what I've seen, you don't really earn wealth, you join it. And that's why, you know, to me, one of the single most important economic changes that came from the Civil Rights Movement was the Loving versus Virginia decision. Is the ability to marry up not just marital relationships but all relationships. You form relationships up the class chain, which is you know it gets wider as as you go up. But you know if you want to be a part of that group that you know has the access, you you join it. We're not you know we should fight to get equal treatment across racial groups, but in in a certain sense you know we always have to, and that's when it comes down to relationships and integration. Is you have to form a community to where you change the definition of what the majority group is. Uh, and to your question, I have this slide on the side here which reflects home values as we went through that great recession and how which groups were hurt the most. And if you look at the green line, and I'm not sure if you can see it here, Mark, but if you look at the green line, which is right at the bo bottom here, that is African Americans. And as we hit this point right here, this is when everything dropped. But those who gained the most were Latino, uh, Latino and Hispanic Americans during the during the recession, they had the most gain in housing values, but then they, they were a third uh, from the bottom. Uh, but the, at the bottom, who lost the most was the African-American community. So that's just some of the data that you were asking. Was your, your greatest asset, those who yeah. suffered the most during the Great Recession, were African-Americans in, in their home values in this green line right here. And still, as we look at 2013 going forward, there's a lot of work to be done. So this is some of the, the numbers behind that, that greatest asset that you're talking about that all Americans have. So, Mark, talk about that. Uh, so let me make sure I understand this chart. Uh, I can't see what's on the, on the vertical axis. Yeah. Is that the value? Value. Of That's the value. Home? That's right. Okay. So a lot of Latinos uh, who bought homes, particularly as the economy was improving, it's important to note that by 2006, we had seen the gap in the unemployment rate between Latinos and non-Latinos virtually disappear. Mm -hmm. So that shows you how much progress had been made in terms of uh, a labor market uh, success. That led to a lot of purchases of housing, particularly in places where the run-up was perhaps the greatest. So that's why the Latinos yeah. look like they're rising so oh, yeah. fast. When you take a look at Big the spike. they look at the broader wealth story of Latinos. Uh, some research we found is that the re, that the recession had a, its biggest impact on Latino wealth overall, partly because of that crash in housing prices. Yep. But it's important to note that not every Latino household owns their home. They're less likely to own That's their right. home. And in fact, for many Latinos, it's really a car or maybe a few other things that is the principal vehicle of wealth that they have. So when you look at the wealth of Latinos, the median is about $5,000, $6,000. For whites, it's more, it's like 150000 or so. So there's a huge, huge difference. For African Americans, about I want to say about eighteen. Thousand, uh, but it's it, there's a big difference in gaps in wealth, and that's partly because not only in home, but there are other factors as well, uh, like Lisa, no four hundred one k. Is it also as you were describing the, the, the what you, you were saying earlier, Lisa, about is it four applicants for a home? Do you have that multi applicant situation too, or no? 
Uh, you do. Uh, not all the time. You no. do. Uh, but there's diversity within the community. So uh, it may be sometimes just a single person like myself applying. Lisa? Yeah. Well, I was just going to say, we haven't talked at all about predatory lending, and we haven't talked at all about some of the um, bad actors Go for um, it. in the mortgage Do market it. that, for some reason, um, the good guys can never get language access right, but the bad guys get it right really well. They are so good at marketing in language, in culture, hiring people from the community. They're so good at it. And so I think that there was a lot of predatory lending. Um, there were a lot of bad products out there, um, and uh, I I think that that also had to do with um, uh, people getting in sort of over their heads. So, and um, this is the Bush administration's American Dream down payment initiative, big push on the ownership society when um, I think it pushed a lot of people uh, into um, – People thought there was money to be made. I should say banks thought there money, it was money to be made um, and went after that market without um, really an eye towards what that was going to have a long-term impact. Some data that might be related to this is yeah. what's up right now. This is the percent of households paying greater than 30% of income for housing yeah. broken down by race and ethnicity. And, of, of course, you, you don't go above certain numbers. Now, 30% is, is probably a borderline number, but you can see here uh, on the left, whites – 35% uh, of those households paying greater than 30% of their income for housing. But all the way on the right, you have 54% for African Americans. And so this, this, this may be consistent w with what you're saying. And Tanner, you were going to react to this. Well, I was just saying about the predatory lending, you know, we made the same mistake 40 years ago with the, uh, with the Fair Housing Act where they said, all right, well, you know, black and low-income communities have been t being denied access to mortgage credit. So the government stepped in and said, we're going to back the Section 30, 235 loans, they were called, we're going to back mortgages and ensure them to, to encourage more lending to the, the, the black community. Well, then you just, it was just like an unlimited risk-free pool of capital for predatory lenders to like jump in and say, hey, yeah, oh, we're going to, you know, give black people homes. And it was just these insane balloon mortgages and everything else. So, you know, they just, it just shows you that, you, you know, if you put, you know, policy solutions without dealing with the fundamental uh, uh, idea of what's going to be done with that, you know, it can be dangerous. Uh, okay, so uh, Mark, right over there, uh, what they're doing is they're putting together a bipartisan bill in the Senate. You scared uh, me. Right over there, I'm like, right over there, yeah. <laughs> right in that corner, right in the corner, they're doing it right now. Uh, they're putting together a bipartisan bill as part of this housing solution that they're, this, the two uh, sponsoring senators uh, are saying is that they should get rid of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and go towards private capital. And, and that will assist the problems uh, that currently exist in the housing market, the structures that are not good, because then you're out into the markets. Uh, what do you think? Well, um, uh, it's hard for me to say any comments on policy because above my pay grade, it's something I'm, I, I can't really speak to. Um, I won't tell anybody. But, well, they're streaming live. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, but uh, I, I do think that... Uh, that with regards to the housing market and the way it's impacting uh, what's happening with Latino and other minority communities, there is, there's a lot of, I think, opportunities to have policy help to shape and, and, and help in many respects, mm -hmm. communities, individuals, families, et cetera. Uh, and I think that uh, we need a lot of discussion about sort of where we're going to go next. I don't know whether or not this is going to work. I don't, I, it's hard for me to give a particular uh, uh, review of this, but I think it will be interesting. I want to get one last question in because I've been rambling on up here. Hi, my name is Pete Dominic. I host a public interest show for Sirius XM. I know we're talking about housing. I'm not sure if this is perfectly fit for your expertise, but uh, we talk about attitudes towards race and culture. Generally, ignorance is the issue. Is there a policy? You mentioned a Supreme Court decision uh, that, that can encourage people who even live in diverse neighborhoods and communities to mix because that seems to be the issue even in a diverse area where I live. People still are very tribal, even though they live next door. Is there any kind of policy? Is that just a behavioral thing? Because I've found that's the answer. People just we, – we generally, when we get together, we have a good time. That's the tweetable I, I, uh, statement there yes. at the end. Yeah. Can, can, can I jump in with some, some numbers? I think it's because there's some, some big changes happening. On the one hand, if you take a look, for example, at interracial and interethnic marriage, those numbers are higher now than they were just uh, 10, 15 years ago. If you look at Latinos and Asian Americans particularly, about a quarter of all newlyweds in those two groups marry somebody who's not of that group. So you're seeing some big changes in terms of interracial, interethnic marriage. You're also seeing many Americans, I think, today beginning to say things such as, I am proud of my mixed-race heritage. So you're finding that many people are now claiming both their... 
uh, Heritage 1 and Heritage 2, and maybe Heritage 3, 4, and 5 at the same time. What I think this is a reflection of is this is a reflection of the very mixing you're talking about, perhaps a specific type of mixing, but that it's happening in a, in a way that is on the rise and it is perhaps more, uh, uh, more uh, prevalent than, uh, than was the case just a few years ago. There is a law. Um, I don't know if it's a federal one, but I do know that there are um, county and, and state laws um, that talk about inclusionary zoning um, that really encourage mixed income uh, and therefore mixed race uh, neighborhoods. Now, um, to your specific issue about your neighbors not really talking to each other, like, I don't know if you can have a law that forces you to have a house party, <laughs> but I mean, I think that... I like that idea, though, maybe. You know, I might, uh, um, I but know. there are sort of laws <laughs> at, a, at a county level. Montgomery County was one of the first counties in the country to have inclusionary zoning laws, and I happen to live in Montgomery County, and um, it's interesting. It's been an experiment. There have been a lot of lessons learned, I think, from Montgomery County um, that have been approved upon, um, but it is really interesting where you have, you know, these literally mansions that are not too far um, time-wise or distance-wise from um, apartment complexes, condos, townhomes, um, smaller uh, single-family homes, etc. So there's a real mix. Everyone uses the same grocery stores. Everyone uses the same pools, uh, etc. So I mean, I think that those are those those are attempts. I think on a federal level, things like choice neighborhoods and um, and sustainable communities. A lot of these federal policies of the Obama administration really were trying to get. At that, so um, I do think that there are um, there are some examples, and I'd be happy to talk to you more. I, I want to close uh, with this question. To all of you, you can answer very briefly because we do have the sixty second mark, which passed sixty seconds ago. Okay, uh, and, and that is, I was thinking of what Cornell was saying and how the last two cycles, when he looked at something that that would stand out, it was just you had new people in the electorate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're about to have new people that are about to be in the economic electorate. You're talking about the youth of these different groups, the three sectors that we've been specifically looking at. Mm -hmm. What does the future bring then for the state of race and housing when we see this increase in the economic electorate vis-a-vis -vis housing, which is the most important asset that these groups would have? If you could close it out for us, each of you. I think some of the uh, demographic changes that are already here, um, that over the course of the next 20 years, they're going to impact the labor market, they're going to impact colleges and universities, and ultimately impact uh, a housing and so forth. So I think we're going to see more diversity as you move forward, but perhaps more challenges as well. Yeah, I think the, the challenges we're going to face, I see the future being sort of breaking in three different pieces. One is that you do have this sort of newly uh, sort of assimilated, diverse majority that's, you know, uh, intermarried people, mixed race people, uh, assimilated minorities, white people who are cool with that. Um, and, and, but then you also have this subgroup of white people that is, in a sense, de-assimilating themselves by refusing to go along with what's obviously already happened. To them, it's this, this resentful group that, that uh, Cornell talked about that, you know, and yeah, Tea Party, yeah, we'll just call it. Um, <laughs> and, and so they're gonna end up, you know, in, in their own little bitter enclaves, but then, I mean, you will also then still be left with, with ethnic clusters, and the question is what, what becomes of them? Are they, you know, transitional uh, spaces to move into this new beige majority? Do you have black communities who, that, that, you know, hold on to, you know, more of a Stokely Carmichael view of life and say, well, no, this is ours, we, we can't give it up and we shouldn't give it up? Um, and do they have the same economic opportunities over here? Um, and what is their relationship to a mixed race majority as opposed to a white majority? Uh, and how does that play out? Hmm. I think we'll find hmm. out what that's going to be. Interesting. Lisa? I think that there's just a lot more um, sophistication in the uh, in people of color voting patterns uh, that people are not uh, Asians aren't voting for Asians because they're Asian, or African Americans aren't voting for African Americans because they're African American. I mean, part of it, but I think that more and more there's going to be a coalition of common values um, around uh, things like taxes and fairness. Um, Asian Americans are perceived to be very fiscally conservative, but when we did exit polling for the first time, um, not only did 33% um, uh, of Asian Americans um, uh, are Democrat, but 73% voted for Obama. Um, and so I think that, and um, I think 64% said, raise my taxes. I was shocked at that, um, you know, because, but I think that there is something about some core values about what kind of society we want to live in um, that is about um, a broader, uh, not just people of color, but a broader coalition of people um, that have, uh, uh, that are just, 
um, not necessarily defined by their race or ethnicity uh, alone, um, particularly with so many more people, um, young people coming up who are mixed race and don't want to be put in these boxes. Um, so, The state of race and housing, Lisa, Tanner, Mark, big round of applause to all of them. Thank you so much.